Morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court. Uh, my name is Richard Schimmel. I'll be addressing the issues in the main appeal. Um, we have reserved five minutes in the rebuttal for Mr. Robinson to address the issues in the uh, cross appeal. Um, Dorothy Tracy petitioned for certiorari in this case because the reported decision of the Court of Special Appeals significantly lowered the quantum of proof required to establish a basis for liability. Uh, against a landlord of a tenant that harbors a pit bull as a family pet. We would be remiss in failing to acknowledge the serious injuries sustained by Mr. Selesky uh, as a result of being attacked by a pit bull owned by Ms. Tracy's dog, uh, tenants. But this case was and is about legal accountability and not about creating a deep pocket merely to compensate an innocent victim. So where did the Court of Special Appeals go wrong? In its dogged determination to change the landscape of this area of the law. I submit to you that the Court of Special Appeals attacked this problem like a blind dog in a meat market. And I'll tell you why. First, dealing with the major issue in this case, the question of vicious propensities, which sort of overarches both the strict liability claim and the negligence claim. Uh, the Court of Special Appeals, while acknowledging that the, in their opinion that there was no direct evidence in the record that Ms. Tracy or her daughter personally observed the aggressive tendencies of the particular pit bulls, the Court of Special Appeals attempted to cobble together circumstantial evidence to prove that uh, basis for prima facie liability. What the Court of Appeals failed to see or ignored, like a blind dog in a meat market, was that there was no actual evidence of prior vicious propensities. There was no evidence of prior escapes from the lease premises, no evidence of any prior assault or any battery by these dogs to either other dogs or to other humans, no prior complaints to the landlord by the neighbors, no sworn testimony from Ms. Tracy or her daughter that they observed such behavior, no admissions in any of the pleadings, or from any of the witnesses that may have heard anything that the landlord said or did, and the absence of any prior animal control or police involvement uh, based on these dogs' behavior. So what did the Court of Special Appeals do uh, in order to establish a prima facie case for liability? Please allow me, in the time allotted, to address the circumstantial evidence, hopefully as quick as a dog can lick a dish. First of all, viciousness was established, according to the Court of Special Appeals, uh, based upon the fact that two of the neighbors observed these dogs jumping and barking. I would submit to you that there is no Maryland case law that suggests that mere jumping and barking is a basis for demonstrating vicious propensities. Was there testimony from one of the uh, witnesses that she, I believe, had observed the, the dog that, that um, attacked the child? climb on the back of the um, female dog within the pen and, and, and reach and perhaps even be on top of that, the fencing that was the exterior of the pen. Could you clarify that for me one more time? Yes. If you look at the record extract at page 242, that incident is described. And that was an incident where the dog in question was trying to get at the neighbor's dog. This was not an attempt to get at the neighbor, and there's no evidence of that. Furthermore, there is no evidence that Ms. Tracy was ever advised of that incident and therefore had neither actual... How do you know that the dog was just trying to get at the neighbor's dog? Because that's what she said. Well, she was with the dog. Well, I, I can't answer that, Your Honor. All I can tell you is that's what her testimony was, that the dog in question was trying to get at her dog. Chronologically, when did that happen? Chronologically? Well, it was days before or months before. Yes. How, how, how far in advance? I'm not particularly sure of the time frame, Your Honor, and I don't know that the record reflects the time frame for that. Was that the same witness who said it is unnerving to say the least? Yes. Uh, to observe the, the, the conduct of that dog? 
Yes. Uh, but, Your Honor, I would submit to you that when it comes to issues of this nature, uh, the Court should adopt an objective rather than a subjective test. Uh, I know people that are afraid of cockroaches. That doesn't mean that they're vicious animals. Uh, and the, the fact that this particular person may have had a particular fear of a barking or a growling dog does not make that dog vicious per se. Speaking of that, um, what is your take on the extent to which, if at all, uh, the fact finder would be entitled to take in, um, to consider the nature of pit bulls as a breed? Well, Your Honor, we, we have the benefit of uh, amicus briefs on that subject, and I would think that if nothing else we learn from the amicus brief is that the jury is out, if you will, as to whether these dogs as a breed are or are not vicious. Would you have been entitled to an instruction to the jury had this gone that far, um, that they are not to consider the nature of the breed? I believe so, because the case law is very clear. In fact, Ward versus Hartley, decided in the Court of Special Appeals by Judge Salmon, made it very clear in that situation that the mere fact that this was a pit bull in and of itself was not sufficient to create a basis for finding it. Is that decision by Judge Salmon somewhat at odds with what we have said? I guess in Matthews, maybe? Well, it, it sort of depends on what you, whether you accept the language in Matthews as dicta or as finding, uh, because the decision in Matthews did not require a finding that, this, the, that pit bulls as a breed were vicious. It was based exclusively on the fact that this particular animal, I believe the dog was troubled. They never have nice names, but uh, it's always Rampage a... Rampage is the name. Uh, Rampage, Rampage or trouble. What's the name of the dog in this case? I believe it was Clifford, Your Honor, but that is not a matter of record. <laughs> yes. Uh, but that was not a matter of record. We don't know no. one way or the other, right? Right. Uh, but, but the point that, that I'm trying to make, Your Honor, is that, that, uh, that there, there, is no, there is no basis, in our opinion, with all due respect, to suggest that all pit bulls are bad uh, any more than it was in the Civil War appropriate to suggest that all African Americans should be slaves or during World War II that all Jews should be gassed. It's just a stereotype that is not appropriate. You, you, you well, think that those type of comparisons are appropriate in a dog bite case? Well, to compare to compare the Holocaust and to compare slavery. No, per, perhaps I'm being a bit too dogmatic. And also, while I'm at it, I don't get your relationship of a blind dog in a meat market. Blind dog do okay in a meat market. I'll, I'll accept your wisdom on that, Your Honor. Well, there is, uh, or a question: Is there not uh, evidence? pretty much all over the country of two things about this breed. One is that physically, uh, the, just the way they are, with the powerful jaws and the fact that when they clamp, they don't bite like this. They just hold on, number one. And number two, that, that they are often bred for aggressive purposes. Would you accept that at least those two facts have been established in judicial decisions and in other? Uh, well, as to the first, Your Honor, I believe that the uh, that the literature is not at all clear on that subject, and I would submit to you that if you check the literature, you'll find that the German Shepherd has a stronger bite than a pit bull. I believe now, they can yes, get 1,500 pounds not, per square inch. I'm not talking inch. about necessarily the strength of the bite. That they let don't let go. They don't let go. And which so was they tear the flesh rather than just puncture it. Well, to that, Your Honor, assuming that it's true, I, I'm, oh, I'm sort of baffled by the notion that we should then find the bite of a Doberman Pinscher or the bite of a Rottweiler more acceptable in no, society. No, I'm asking you about two things together. One is that, that, that the evidence, I believe, I'm, I'm asking if you agree or don't agree, shows that when they do bite, they cause more significant damage than other breeds have. And number two, that they are <coughs> trained, often bred and trained for aggressive purposes. Uh, I will concede the latter, Your Honor, because there, that, that is unfortunately the Michael Vick syndrome. But there's no evidence in this case that these dogs were bred for that purpose. As to the former proposition, I believe that the literature, that the literature as opposed to the case law, which is not based on science, uh, is, is not clear on that subject. But I will concede that there is a body of, of, of literature out there which suggests what you're saying is accurate. 
But if that's true, would you have to then show, the evidence would have to show that there was some breeding done in this particular case? Correct. And there would have to be some evidence of the record showing that the tenants bred this dog to be vicious. And there, the record is completely devoid of any such evidence. Well, did they do the well. breeding? Well, I don't, I don't even accept the word breeding, Your Honor, uh, because all that happened here was there was a male and a female dog and they had puppies. Uh, the appellee well, suggests that's breeding. The, because the uh, uh, respondent does make the statement in, in the brief that Miss Tracy was on notice that her tenants were breeding pit bulls, and I didn't see anything in the record extract on those pages that documented that. But were there puppies? Were they breeding these two? They, they weren't breeding. They, they, they had a physical relationship and had puppies. How can you have puppies without there being breeding? Well, I think that the breeding to which the appellee was referring was a breeding farm, and the statute that they were referring to was acting as a business breeding animals, which is a big that, distinction. Would you agree that in determining whether a dog is vicious or not, it is appropriate to also consider the capabilities of the animal? Um, it, you, you can consider the capabilities of the animal, Your Honor, but you can't generalize it for all animals of a particular breed. And the problem in this case was that the record was completely devoid of any evidence as to prior misbehavior of these dogs other than the limited testimony of the two tenants, uh, who, who, the two uh, neighbors who testified. What was interesting was that the Celestis uh, themselves never testified to have any problems with this dog, even though they were a neighbor. Eric Rasmussen, whose backyard abutted the property in question, never testified to having any problems with these dogs. Did you so, think there was evidence there were puppies that came out of this? My understanding is that at the time of this incident, there, were, there was a litter of puppies. Uh, so that would have been in violation of the lease, would it not? The um, lease limited them to two dogs. Uh, yes, it would have been in violation of the lease. But the, but the breeding, the, the birth of puppies was not the proximate cause. There's no evidence that, that was the proximate cause of the injuries sustained by Dominic Seleski. How old were the puppies? I have no idea. The incident with the uh, neighbor walking the dog in the alley that provoked the response, uh, was that, does the evidence reflect that was communicated to the landlord before the incident? In no, there is no prior notice whatsoever. And, and the record, the record as it exists is not clear as to the amount of time lap that elapsed between the time of the first incident involving the friend and the time that Dominic was injured. But it clearly happened in the same, on the same day and while they were in the same play cycle, if you will. When the tenants originally established uh, their residency on this property, there was one pit bull, right? Um, yes. And then when they, when they renewed, there were renewed two. Renewed the lease with the new lease, there were two. Correct. Was the male or the female the first pit bull in residence? I really don't know, Your Honor, and I don't think the record is clear on that subject. Um, but uh, once again, I'm not sure that that makes any particular difference in terms of what we're evaluating here, uh, because to suggest that the terms of the lease somehow created liability, uh, that dog won't hunt, uh, plain and simple. Was, uh, was, is there anything in the literature that discusses whether a pit bull is more likely to attack a human or more likely to attack a dog or other non-human? Well, I'm sure that org would suggest that there is literature to that effect, but the ASPCA thinks otherwise. Um, so I, I, the problem I have is for a court of law to take judicial notice of that proposition is highly irregular. And the fact that there was no evidence, expert or otherwise, presented at trial to establish uh, that proposition uh, to me is, is uh, critical. Uh, the uh, location of the attack. Yes. It, am I correct? It, it happened in an alley adjacent to the premises. Yes. And in our other case, I think it was Shields and uh, uh, Matthews. Uh, one happened in the lease premises. Correct. The other happened in the parking lot. Right. Does it make any difference that it happened off the premises? Absolutely, Your Honor, because the the basis for the Matthews decision um, was that it happened on premises, but the theory was that the landlord had control by virtue of having a no pets provision. In this case, we have a yes pets provision. 
So Matthews is completely distinguishable with respect to an injury occurring on the premises, and this did not occur on the premises. With respect to Shields, on the other hand, the justification for finding liability was that it happened in a common area, namely a parking lot. This alleyway is in no man's land. This alleyway is not a common area, and the suggestion to the contrary is, is just wrong. Well, I don't, I'm not entirely sure about your characterization of it being a no man's land. It is a little murky, um, but they did put the deed into the record, did they not? They did, Your Honor. Didn't it describe it? Something that could, uh, under a generous interpretation, uh, uh, say that everyone had a right to use the alley that bordered on the alley? Well, having, uh, yes, one could, Your Honor, but, but having Why a right. Why is that a good analogy to a common area? No, because there's a difference between having a right to use the alley and the obligation to maintain it. And I think that's an important well, distinction. That was, that was murky. Yes, uh, it wasn't developed. And frankly, the Seleskis had the same provision in their, lead, in their deed as well as everybody else adjoining that, that property. Well, let's turn for a minute to the, uh, we've been, I think we've been talking a lot about the strict liability claim. What about the negligence claim? Well, I mean, for example, if I understand, the pin is, is a, basically a, a wire or a chain link, six by six, four feet tall and open at the top. Right? Here it is. It's in the record, okay. Appendix 1. Okay. Is there any evidence in the record of um, standards for uh, it's okay not to have a, a top on a four-foot-tall dog run? There, there was no evidence whatsoever presented at trial establishing that this pen was inadequate. This was all the, the, um, the, the statements and claims uh, in, in the briefs and in argument. But there was never any standard established as to whether this was an adequate pen. And I would submit to Your Honor that this is not a makeshift pen, as the appellee would suggest. Uh, and the fact that this dog was clever enough to climb on top of the back of another dog that particular day to get out of this pen uh, was not a predictable event given this. That particular day, excuse me, uh, Mr. Schimmel. Wasn't there some evidence that, that at least one other person had observed the dog do, do that same thing? The dog yeah. never escaped from the pen. The dog yeah, attempted to escape. I'm talking about climbing on the back of... Yeah, climbed on the back and attempted to get over it, but didn't succeed. This is that same witness who, yes. who said... Yes, that, that's, the, on, that's, the, that's the only incident where that happened. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that the issue here is not whether the tenant is responsible for the dog. The issue is whether the landlord is responsible. Let's keep our eyes on the prize here. The landlord was never given any knowledge of that. And the suggestion in that the two or three or four times that Ms. Uh, Tracy may have came to this, come to this property, that the dog was going to demonstrate that unique characteristic is nothing more than wishful thinking. And there's nothing to suggest any report back to the landlord. That is correct. Um, what, what, uh, what relevance do we do we find in the change in of the terms of the lease? I don't find any relevance whatsoever, Your Honor. Uh, it's it's dogma in the state of Maryland that um, exculpatory clauses are considered enforceable uh, unless they're in violation of public policy. This was nothing more than an exculpatory clause, and to suggest that having an exculpatory clause creates as a basis for liability is like a dog wagging his tail, because. Are we, um, are we limited in, in, on this question um, to examination, if at all, of, the, of only the second lease? Because this happened when it was re, re-upped, right? Uh, and the terms changed a bit, didn't they, with regard to the pets? The terms changed, but the relationship of landlord and tenant at the time of the incident was determined by the second <laughs> lease. And I would submit to Your Honor that, that the leasehold relationship between landlord and tenant has absolutely nothing to do with the relationship between the landlord and a third party. The problem I have with this notion about the lease having some responsibility and even enforcing no pets clause is that the no pets clause is for the protection of the landlord, not the tenant well, does it or, or the third party. Mm -hmm. um, does it give us any indication or would it give a fact finder legitimately any indication of what the landlord knew about these, this particular pet. I think that's a leap of faith. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. <clears throat> May it please the Court. Uh, 
Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Kevin Dunn. I represent the Seleskis, who happen to be in the court today um, because they wanted to be. Uh, Mr. Seleski, Mrs. Seleski, and Dominic. Um, we're here today because of the vicious attack on Dominic on April 28, 2007. We're not here today on a referendum on pit bulls. The appellant's brief, the appellant's reply brief, the ASPCA brief, uh, amicus brief, have all attempted to make this case a referendum on pit bulls. It is not, and this court need not reach that issue in order to resolve this case. This case is simply about whether or not there was enough evidence for a Baltimore County jury to decide whether or not a, uh, the landlord was liable for Dominic's injuries. Well, well, detail the evidence that is sufficient. Judge Meredith called it a syllogism in his, uh, in his published opinion for the Court of Special Appeals. He said that there was uh, evidence from two neighbors that te uh, who testified of the vicious or aggressive nature of these dogs. One neighbor... The difference between vicious and aggressive. Um, that's an interesting uh, uh, issue, Your Honor, and I don't think that... Most of us have seen, at least I recall, when I was a kid, I used to see dogs uh, at the fence mm -hmm. trying to get across the fence mm -hmm. because I walked by. I'm not sure whether those dogs were vicious or not. I thought they might have been, but... There is a difference, isn't there? Well, the jurisprudence on this issue when it comes to dog bites mixes up viciousness and uh, aggressiveness. And in fact, the legal standard that has been most recently enunciated by in most courts uh, in terms of notice talks about aggressiveness. Because how are we going to define the subjective terms? It's really the eye of the beholder whether it's aggressive or vicious. Right. Now, but, now that goes to the next one. <coughs> Go continue your, your, your catalog. Right. Of I'm going to talk about the two witnesses. Judge Barbera asked about this. One witness was walking her dog, and it was a little dog, and she felt like her dog might get literally eaten, changed her habits, stopped walking the dog near the pen, and that was the, the witness who saw the male dog on the back teeter-tottering over the edge, uh, almost getting out. The other witness to testify was named Lisa Luntz, and she was walking her child, her infant, in a stroller. Uh, her testimony, uh, which was recited specifically in the Court of Special Appeals opinion, um, said this, and it's relevant enough that, that I'm going to read a portion of it. She testified under oath at trial. In terms of when both the male and female came along, because originally there was just the female, so the female was there for a year, and so the male came along. Um, originally, when the male was a puppy, there was definite barking, but I certainly didn't feel threatened, or, or they didn't appear too aggressive. However, as soon as the male dog was getting older and bigger, that's when we noticed frequent barking and jumping. You know, remember, this time our daughter was about a year and a half, and we were definitely concerned at that point because anybody that walked out of our home or to our home from the back would experience the aggression from the dogs, particularly the male dog, so unnerving to say the least. So those were the two witnesses who testified uh, on personal knowledge of how these dogs acted. And I would have to say it was also in the short term uh, preceding months before the attack on Dominic, because the male, male dog had only arrived recently. First lease is for a year, it ends in December 2006. Um, and the male must have arrived at the end of the lease because there was a litter of puppies in the house on January 23rd when, when Dorothy Tracy and her daughter, Ms. Schistler, were there. So the male came, and these neighbors who saw the male in the pen could have only, I think, seen it in the uh, February, March, April time period. The attack on Dominic was in April, April 28th of 2007. We know that uh, Ms. Tracy had been leasing this, uh, this house to these uh, tenants for a year prior to the new lease starting, uh, which uh, I guess they had a month-to-month -month uh, tenancy after the first lease expired because it wasn't renewed as of December 31. This lease was, was signed, I think, on January 23, 2007. And there was testimony that uh, they parked their car in the rear of the, of the um, house uh, whenever they went there whenever Ms. Schistler and Tracy went there on January 23, 2007. The syllogism that Judge, Judge Meredith wrote was this. There was evidence and testimony that the dogs acted aggressively towards anybody who came near the pen. Ms. Tracy and Ms. Schistler uh, parked next to the pen on the day they came there. Ergo, it was a jury question whether or not the dogs exhibited 
uh, uh, aggressive behavior that day so much as to put the landlord on notice. In addition, the fact that the second lease, which was created by Ms. Schisler, the adult daughter of Ms. Tracy, at Ms. Tracy's direction, had the special language, the special exculpatory language, um, the capitalization of the words no and way. Uh, in no way will the landlord be, be civically or financially responsible if these dogs cause injury. It goes to the question of foreseeability and the foreseeability of the harm. Um, though, that's the answer to your question, Judge Bell. That, that's the evidence that we have, and that's the syllogism. It hasn't been Karen Terriers, two Karen Terriers, and that language was in the lease. Would that have been some uh, foreseeable uh, factor to consider as to whether or not the Karen Terriers were aggressive or vicious? Which, what, what fact are you asking me, Your Honor? The fact that they were Karen Terriers? No, the fact that you had the, the provisions in the lease. You said that goes to the issue of foreseeability well, on the part of the landlord. Let me, I'll frame it another way. When my Karen Terrier bit me, was he aggressive, vicious, or smart? The question that you asked me goes specifically to what did the court mean in Matthews when that four to three decision came down? It Matthews was, is the one in the apartment or is it in the apartment? The, the one that you dissented in, Your Honor. Yeah, okay. I, I didn't. With Judge, I joined a dissent. With Judge Chasnow, right. Um, Matthews is a curious case. I really didn't dissent in that case for all the reasons that Judge Chasnow put down. Uh, I dissented because I of my concern for the rights of landlords, but not you. for respect so much as to his concerns about how you classify a pit bull. Right. Well, the court said two things. Judge Eldridge wrote the majority opinion. It was a four to three decision. And it came only two months after Shields v. Wagman, which was the most curious thing. But Matthew said, and it was almost a finding of uh, judicial notice by an appellate court. And it said in hot verba, the extreme dangerous, dangerousness of this breed as it has evolved today is well recognized. And Judge Eldridge follows that with a very lengthy footnote, footnote four, that cites at least 12 jurisdictions that had already upheld the constitutionality of dog-specific uh, breed legislation, in, uh, mostly regarding pit bulls. There were other dogs in some of those statutes, but regarding vicious animals. And in the analysis of those cases, which didn't have specific bearing on a landlord case or landlord liability, um, Judge Elders noted in the footnote that each of the courts that he cited in footnote four around the United States, and the jurisdictions are quite varied, um, that, that the inherent viciousness of pit bulls provided the rational basis or nexus for the legislature to ban them. And therefore, in each of those cases, the, the bans were upheld as constitutional insofar as the criminal prosecution that was usually pending whenever it was in front of an appellate court. So Matthew said that. And it didn't say what Judge Chazanow said, that the, the, the majority opinion, in essence, makes ownership of a pit bull per se negligent. That might have been the, the goal at some point in 1998. However, in, in the important paragraph uh, in Section uh, 2 of the opinion, Judge Eldridge wrote, uh, he paragraph starts to reiterate, he had four conditions in here uh, where, where they found the li li landlord should be uh, open to liability if a jury judges so. He wrote, where a landlord retained control over the matter of animals in the tenant's apartment, that was one. Two, coupled with the knowledge of past vicious behavior by the animal. Three, the extreme dangerous nature of pit bull dogs. And four, the foreseeability of harm to people uh, on the property, property or in the apartment complex. Now, Matthews involved for the first time in Maryland a landlord being held liable for an attack that occurred inside the property, inside the unit. And that's, that's important because this court crossed the threshold at that point. No one in Maryland had ever been held liable for that kind of, excuse me, behavior because it was the issue of control. Once the landlord hands over the keys to the tenant, they cede over control of the property. However, there are, there are circumstances where they don't cede over the control. Now let's go back two months to Shields v. Wagman a 7-0 decision, a unanimous decision uh, written by Judge Chasnow. And in Shields v. Wagman, which is the parking lot case, um, the evidence at trial, 
And in Shields v. Wagman, the judge granted uh, a judgment uh, to the defendants after the uh, plaintiff had rested, so it never got to a jury. So they're examining the case on what evidence was before and what's the best light and whether it should go to a jury. In Shields v. Wagman, there was no direct evidence that the landlord knew of the viciousness or aggressiveness of, was it Rampage or, or I think it was Rampage in, in Shields. No direct evidence. There was circumstantial evidence that the dog was usually there. There was circumstantial evidence that people had, uh, uh, had to testify that they had seen this dog barking at them or the dog acted aggressive towards them. There was also no evidence that that dog had ever bitten anyone. There was no direct evidence that the dog had ever gotten off a chain, but that was murky, shall we say, because the dog was off and on a chain, although there was a witness to check, testify that the dog was held in an uh, uh, encasement that had like chicken uh, coop uh, wiring around it. So in Shields v. Wagman, this court held unanimously that where that evidence existed, where the landlord who was often there himself also, uh, but who had, there was no direct knowledge of what he knew, it was enough to get to a jury that he knew that there was a dog there. There was testimony of other people that uh, they said the dog was aggressive or vicious. Uh, and then there was an attack that occurred on, uh, on two uh, visitors uh, who were on the shopping center property. Is the test for knowledge um, raised in terms of what the landlord should have known had he been acting as a reasonable person? Yes, Your Honor. It's a reasonableness test. It's a negligence test of reasonable behavior. What is the evidence in this record of the conduct of the dog, dogs, prior to the January visit of the land, landlord, property owner, and her daughter. There is no evidence. Um, so I attempted the to take. The syllogism is looking in the rearview mirror instead absolutely. of through the windshield. Absolutely, Your Honor. And uh, although uh, this decision wasn't resolved in my client's favor at the Court of Special Appeals, one of my cross appeal issues is, as Judge Martin said uh, in granting judgment against my client, uh, the conundrum that I was in. Okay, premises liability case, I have to prove knowledge or uh, opportunity of putting your head in the sand. I try to take the deposition of, of, the, of the defendant uh, who owned multiple properties. I, we schedule a deposition. Three or four days beforehand, I get a phone call from the assistant to the, uh, the insurance company's lawyer who said, uh, Ms. Tracy's not going to be there. And I said, we agreed on this. And he said, well, she can't be there. And he procured a letter from an, an internist um, that said uh, it would be better if she didn't go to a deposition because she's 89 years old. Um, okay. So I said, well, I still need to get her testimony. Somebody else is not quite enough. They brought Ms. Schistler, uh, who was her adult daughter, who knew some things but didn't know most and many important <laughs> facts. However, Ms. Schistler disclosed something very interesting. Um, she disclosed that while they were there on January 23rd, 2007, the day that the, lease, the second lease was signed, they brought a, a digital camera with them. And they brought that camera for their own purposes, for their own economic purposes. They wanted to um, take snapshots of how the place looked, what was going on. And, the, and Ms. Schistler testified that she took photographs and that that was a normal thing that her mother wanted to do whenever she leased the property. So at her deposition, and I keep in mind, I filed a request for production of documents. I filed interrogatories. The only document I got before Ms. Schistler's deposition was the second lease, and then after her deposition, they somehow found the Long and Foster first lease, even though they, she testified that her mother had no papers, uh, nothing to do with any property she ever rented after she moved uh, from Timonium, to, I'm sorry, from Luther Gold to Timonium. The camera somehow between the date those pictures were taken on January 23, 2007, and when I deposed Miss Tracy, but her agent and her daughter, Miss Schistler, was no longer around. It was not to be found. The explanation was the camera had broken. I said it was a digital camera. She said, yeah. She told me it was digital. I said, well, Digital cameras still have a database. We can we can download that somewhere else. You're suggesting that there was some spoliation. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. And what does that? How how can we treat that fact 
As an appellate court. As an appellate court, it's so rare that evidentiary issues in civil cases ever get to this court. Almost all evidentiary issues this court decides are from criminal matters, as a matter of practicality. And discovery issues in civil matters almost never reach the light of day in appellate courts, let alone the court of appeals. In this instance, where we knew of the existence of these photographs, and then they weren't available when we went to take discovery after Dominic was mauled, and now they're not available. But didn't the judge, how did the trial judge deal with that? Judge Fader dealt with it, not the trial judge. Judge Fader said that he's not going to require an 89-year-old to go to a deposition and that I should pursue other methods to get information. That's what he wrote in his discovery ruling. Did you argue? I asked for a spoliation instruction from Judge Martin at trial, and he declined, relying on Judge Fader's order. But the jury went your way anyway. I didn't get to a jury, Judge. It was taken away from me. I never got there. My point is this. Spoliation classically involves, first of all, the knowledge that something exists and then the absence of it later on. It doesn't matter why it's not there. It doesn't matter. But somebody's entitled to an instruction at that point that a presumption should have existed that something on there was not in favor of the defendant. You're saying that if it goes back for a retrial, there should be a spoliation instruction. That's why I filed a cross-appeal, Judge, yes. Not only that, but that we should consider the factor of spoliation in deciding whether there was sufficient evidence. Well, I think it's – I think Judge Merritt's opinion is more than sufficient in Maryland where a minimum amount of evidence is necessary to get to a jury. I don't need a person. He doesn't get to the spoliation. He affirmed – he affirmed Judge Fader's ruling. Yes. What he said was, I find no abuse of discretion. They find no – Well, you didn't cross-petition on that. I guess my – you did not cross-petition on – I did. You did? That's in my petition. I did, ma'am. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's specifically me. I didn't see it in your – It is, Your Honor. Can you comment on the height of the four-foot fence as to whether or not my limited experience at all is you need a minimum of six feet to be able to get inside, but I don't know if there's any particular standards for the height of the fence. Because I'm an appellate court judge, and I don't – I'm making a record. Let me rephrase my question. I can answer your question two ways. One, you have a picture, and the picture was an appendix to my brief. Is your answer, if the dog can jump out of it, the fence is not high enough? Well, no. No, my curious answer is you have an amicus brief from the ASPCA, but they, in fact – it's not in the record, Judge – but they, in fact, have standards for the keeping of dogs in pens, and that pen violated their own standards for one or two dogs. But there are standards. There was no such proof of trial. The pen in question – But their standard would relate to the well-being of the dog, whether the pen is big enough for the dog to be – I couldn't have said it any better. They care about the dogs, not about who the dogs might attack and kill. Yes. But their own standards would have said that this dog and this dog owner was keeping this dog and those dogs inhumanely. It was an improper pen for such dogs to be – it was not in the record, though. But in as much as you have the amicus brief in front of you, I found it curious that they could argue one way, but they wouldn't argue – they wouldn't tell you the other thing. Refresh my recollection. Yes, ma'am. In the deposition of Ms. Schistler that you did take – Yes, ma'am. What did she say? Did you ask, and what did she say? She said – About the conduct of the dogs when she and Ms. Tracy were there. She only talked about seeing the dogs. She didn't talk about behavior. Did you ask? I don't believe I did. Were they barking at you? Were they doing this? I don't believe I asked those questions. Okay. Well, then, again, with the notion of looking in the rearview mirror at what happened after that, to impute that it also happened or something like it happened in January when they were there, why didn't you close the loop? The first issue was I was still pursuing a deposition of Ms. Tracy. I thought I – Ms. Schistler – Okay. Well, the rules of golf, you play the ball where you find it. Yes, I do. That's correct, Judge. The evidence that I was able to adduce was what you've heard about the two neighbors testifying. I don't know what Ms. Schistler and Ms. Tracy saw that day. Now, I will also tell you that there was no affidavit put in by Ms. Schistler in terms of what she saw or didn't see. There was no affirmative evidence. I will suggest this, though, that when the Court wrote what it wrote in Matthews, 
there had to have been a purpose. There had to be a reason why the court said the extreme viciousness of this breed is well known and then cite to 12 to 15 other jurisdictions. And interestingly, in the paragraph after the four that I read, the one paragraph that had the four points in it, Judge Eldridge, citing to Prosser, uh, wrote here, he said the following principle from Prosser is applicable here. The prophylactic factor of preventing future harm has been quite important in the field of torts. The courts are concerned not only with the compensation of the victim, but with admonition of the wrongdoer. When the decisions of this court, of the courts become known, when the decision of courts become known, and defendants realize that they may be held liable, there is, of course, a strong incentive to prevent the occurrence of the harm. Not infrequently, one reason for imposing liability is the deliberate purpose of providing that incentive. So while I, don't, I, I, I can't at least state there was no per se rule established there, the point was that a message was being sent. And Judge Chazanow, in the opening page of his dissent, said effectively the majority issues a per se rule of negligence. Let me, let me contrast that because it's most interesting with Ward v. Hartley. And Ward v. Hartley, I don't contest, was wrongly decided. In the case that we talked about earlier, uh, Judge Salmon, uh, when you were talking about that, uh, Judge Barber. Mm -hmm. Ward v. Hartley involved in West Baltimore. Um, a taxi cab driver shows up. He's been called to go to uh, pick up a fare. And they don't come out when he honks his horn, so he walks up to the door. A row house that's on uh, major, the major road that, that, uh, that St. Agnes is on, Judge. Oh, uh, the one that it, in the city when it changes name. Well, back. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So the, so, the, so the cabbie's at the door knocking. And the door opens, and out comes a dog that was argued it was a pit bull or it was a pit bull uh, uh, mix. The testimony at trial was that the cabbie heard somebody yell, uh, watch out or don't open that door. And there was a conflict on what uh, it turned out to be the mother of the child that had opened the door meant by that. Now, in Ward v. Hartley, the plaintiff asked, for a, a per se rule that the Court of Special Appeals, after Judge Kaplan at trial, uh, Joseph Kaplan at trial, uh, granted uh, the motion of the defendant at the conclusion of the plaintiff's case, they asked the Court of Special Appeals to acknowledge that Matthews had created a per se rule and that Ward v. Hartley Court declined to do so. What is the difference between Ward v. Hartley and Matthews <coughs> and Shields? It's quite simple. In Ward, in, in Ward v. Hartley, there was a lease. There was no mention of dogs in the lease, and there was no evidence that the, that the, that the landlord knew of the dog in the unit. In work. No evidence that the landlord knew of the dog, and no evidence that the landlord knew anything about the dog. Didn't know about any dog. There was no permissibility or prohibition on the dog. And therefore, in Ward v. Hartley, the Court of Special Appeals, in applying Shields and in applying Matthews, said no per se rule, and you haven't proven that there was any a violation of the duty, because in the end, what we're talking about here goes back to very simple um, torts 101, negligence, duty, and foreseeability. And we know from, from Jacques and we know from Matthews that where there is a potential for injury, that the duty in the foreseeable, uh, under negligence standards, the duty uh, uh, is lessened. It's, there's no privity required because injury is possible. Um, I'll take 30 more seconds, if it please. You've got a minute. Okay. You've still got a minute. Thank you, Judge. Um, and therefore, um, we look to the knowledge and we look to what the landlord uh, was capable of knowing or what they actually did know. When the Court of Special Appeals was considering whether a prima facie case had been made uh, by the Seleskis in this case, they looked at the evidence that was there, what a jury could reasonably have inferred, the fact that the landlord had, had changed and ginned up a lease and acknowledged, in essence, the presence of the dogs and acknowledged, at least in their own mind, that the dogs could do injury shall in no way be financially or civically responsible for the injuries, um, and said, in essence, in Maryland, this goes to a jury. We're not opining on whether or not the plaintiff should win or lose. We're not opining 
And, and by the way, there's almost no mention of the pit bull issues in the Court of Special Appeals opinion. This Court need not reach that issue to simply affirm and send back. But I would ask that on my cross-appeal questions that we do have the opportunity to have an instruction on spoliation due to the, the photographs which did exist that have been thrown away. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the Court, my name is Robert. Yes, sir, Your Honor. May it please the Court, my name is Clifford Robinson. I will be addressing the cross appeals by the uh, police. Uh, Your Honor, at the time the deposition was noted, my client, Ms. Tracy, was 89 years of age. I received information from her daughter, Ms. Schisler, about her medical condition. And 10 days before the deposition, in the letter dated March 19th, uh, he was advised that she had medical issues which would prevent her from being, uh, having her testimony taken by way of deposition. But it was okay to sit at trial the entire time? Your Honor, at trial she wasn't, re she wasn't asked any questions. She wasn't required to participate in a multiple. Uh, that was less stressful to, that your exposure to liability was being adjudicated? Your Honor. You had a doctor's certificate that said that wasn't too stressful? Given her lack of clarity as to what was taking place around here, Your Honor, I don't, I don't think it made a whole lot, that much difference. I thought, and she thought, and her daughter thought it was important for the jury to know that she cared about her case. She, I agree when we got there that she wasn't going to testify because she wasn't deposed. She merely just sat there, sat there at the trial. Um, when Mr. Dunn was placed on notice, he was given a letter 10 days before the deposition. His brief says that at, at the last minute this happened. Not, that's not true. Realizing his plight, so to speak, realizing the little bit of a predicament that he would be in, I offered up Ms. Schisler, who had informed me that she knew a lot about the situation that she drafted at least, that she drove her mother there. Basically, her mother never went there when she wasn't there, uh, et cetera. Uh, and he agreed to do that, although I'll reserve the right to take her deposition later. But I made her available. The critical thing here is, just like in Matthews, which was a corporate defendant, which was ultimately found liable, they proved the liability on the corporate defendant through its agents. And they received evidence from the maintenance people there at the apartment complex that that dog rampage had tried to bite them, had snapped at them, and other employees of the corporation had that knowledge, which was then imputed to the, um, to the landlord. Uh, so he had the opportunity to do that with Ms. Schisler. He asked her one question about the dogs. Were the dogs there? Yes, they were in the living room when we were there on January 23rd. That is the only question he asked her about the dog. Did he jump at you? Did they bark at you? Did he try to snap at you? Did you see those dogs growling? Did you see those dogs fighting with one another? Did you see them trying to bite your mother? Did you see them trying to bite anybody else? Nothing whatsoever about the dogs. Can we learn anything from the fact that in the first lease where one dog was allowed, there was no attempt to exculpate herself. Uh, in the second lease, where you've got two dogs and a litter, apparently, that they knew about, so <coughs> there's breeding going on, she specifically puts in the lease, uh, I'm not responsible for any damage these dogs do. That's all you. Yep. Doesn't that, is it a fair inference of some foreseeability from that? That there are two dogs that, that there are two dogs that she saw in the house, uh, regardless with the breed. I don't know if that makes it foreseeable to her or anyone else that those dogs might one day viciously attack a young man. Because keep in mind, up to that point, there's no evidence at all that these dogs had ever gotten out, that these dogs have ever bitten anybody, ever tried to bite anybody. Nothing uh, was produced from, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, animal control folks, nothing from the police department, nothing from a mailman, UPS person, delivery person, bg &E, nothing there whatsoever. Also in the cross appeal, uh, the question about uh, the judge not allowing in all these newspaper articles, um, and I, I wouldn't suggest that those would ever be admissible for the truth of what they say, um, but uh, would they be admissible just to show general knowledge that there was at least reporting of a special problem with pit bulls attacking most I would young children? I would suggest not, Your Honor. Those, he searched seven years, uh, plaintiff counsel or appellate counsel, he searched seven years for records. They found evidence of 17 separate dog bite attacks over a seven-year time period, no more than two or three 
per year. When you look at all the articles that are listed, it looks as if there are many more than that, but many of those refer to the same incident. So you have to look at them very carefully as I did. Um, so 17 dog bite attacks by pit bulls over a seven year period, I don't think we'll put anybody on notice that they're much more prone to bite than any other breed. In addition, Your Honor, of those 49 articles that were submitted, if you look at those articles closely, you'll see that 10 of those did not appear in the Baltimore County area, as he has suggested, because they say Anne Arundel County, Howard County edition. So 10 of those 49 were never even published in the Baltimore area, and uh, Ms. Trace at the time was living in Moncton in northern Baltimore County. Not to mention the fact that she had macular degeneration, the evidence was put in from her daughter, daughter her daughter had to read to her, uh, and no evidence whatsoever that they even received the signed papers. Um, so to, to stand for that proposition that, that they would have, um, have in fact, um, um, that, that, that would have placed her on, on notice. Uh, I think I have to defer now to... Yes. If we were to determine that the trial court or the motions court um, committed error in not giving any relief with regard to the request for some sort of instruction or other relief uh, as a result of the spoliation facts, what impact could that have on our decision today? I would say it would have none, Your Honor. The argument that, that counsel gives for why the spoliation was so damaging was because it did not enable them to be able to describe the condition of the property and the existence of the pen. It was stipulated that the pen, which is in evidence, the photograph, which was taken a day after the bite by a news crew, that that's the pen. Nobody's disputing that. What if maybe the um, evidence included a photograph of one of the dogs jumping on top of the other one in an effort to get out of the pen? I, I would suggest, Your Honor, even if there's an evidence, uh, a, f a photograph of a dog in a house in the living room where she saw them jumping on the other dog would not mean that that person would be on notice. Did that we dog. Know the dogs were in the living room the whole time? It was Appendix 7 of the reply brief, Your Honor. When she said when she got there that the two dogs were there and they were in the living room, that was the only question asked of her about those dogs. Nothing else, nothing else whatsoever. The other thing, too, about the spoliation argument, there's, there's testimony that she had a camera and took and clicked going around the house. They never got any further than that. So there's really nothing that existed that, that was actually destroyed, nor the time with which um, that, that uh, camera was discarded. Thank you. Thank you, sir. General. Just a couple of points. Uh, addressing Judge Werner's concerns about uh, the characteristics of pit bulls, I would suggest to you that. Not uh, my concerns. They're, they're someone's concerns. Concerns that were laid out in, uh, in Matthews. Uh, I, I would suggest that there's the, the conclusions about the characteristics of pit bulls are suspect due to breed misidentification. They're suspect due to unreporting of attacks by other breeds due to lack of newsworthiness. It's a lot more exciting to report about a pit bull attack than a chihuahua attack or a cairn. The problem with that, though, is that, that what was cited in, in Matthews in, in that footnote were a whole string of judicial decisions finding that. Well, as I've indicated previously, those judicial they're findings are – well, true? I don't know if they're wrong or right, Your Honor. All I can tell you is that the science doesn't support the decisions. Plain and simple. Uh, and there were also. There, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, what are you relying on? Well, it, you, the amicus brief of the ASPCA. And, and some of the. Who knows whether that's generally accepted in the state? Well, I, I guess the problem, Your Honor, is I don't know what. I don't know what Judge Eldridge was basing it on other than someone else's opinion, and I don't know if you explore those opinions whether you're going to find any science in those opinions either. How many of those cases that were cited in Matthews for the proposition? Of generalization about pit bulls as a breed were cases involving challenges to legislation outlawing them in certain jurisdictions. Thank you for throwing me that bone, Your Honor. Uh, the reality is, is that most of them did involve issues of whether the legislation was constitutional because whether, and whether it was rationally based. This is, not a, this is not a legislation case. This is a tort liability case, and that's an important difference. Um, Judge Bell addressed the nuance between viciousness and aggressiveness. I would suggest to you another issue to address is territoriality. Lots of times dogs who are in pens will bark and growl to protect their territory. That doesn't mean that they're likely to attack. And that's an important distinction to be made. Um, Is there any discussion about dogs barking when they're on invisible fences and they're right up at the edge of the fence? Um, Does that 
Is that related to t territoriality? Probably not, Your Honor, but uh, that's not this case. Uh, and finally, uh, Mr. Dunn is wrong when he suggests that there's no evidence in S.H.I.E.L.D. of prior notice of uh, vicious propensities by the defendant in that case. If the court looks carefully at the decision, there's ample evidence of that. Uh, I'm going to take a stab in the minute that I have left. Uh, I probably should let sleeping dogs lie, but I'm going to suggest that there is a basis for having uh, the decisions in Shields and, uh, and Matthews overturned. I'm hoping that I can teach um, what I won't characterize as old dogs, new tricks, uh, and I hope... You're just full of similes and metaphors. Yes, I am, Your Honor. I like yeah, to have fun in my job. You don't know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> If you were sitting in Milan, that would be different. Uh, and I, I hope that the court will pay, pay careful attention to the bases for the arguments that I think they should be overturned. I will concede that the facts of this case are completely dissimilar to the facts in those two cases. But I believe that as the Court of Appeals, you have the opportunity to right a wrong and to correct uh, a law, a common law, which is, is wrong-headed. You ever been bitten by a dog? Yes, I have, Your Honor. Uh, it was a Neapolitan Mastiff. That's even That's bigger than a pit bull. Yes, got claws. It's got, bear, it's got claws like a bear, Your Honor. I was I was trying to uh, I was doing a favor for a client who was legally blind. I was taking her to her deposition. You got your own legs. You didn't take yeah. a leg off. She invited me to meet her friendly dog Blue, and uh, friend, the dog was circling around a, a tree. And I went to meet Blue, and Blue greeted me with a, a bite to my arm. So yes, I have experienced it, Your Honor. Okay, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Please, please the court again. Um, whatever whatever happened to the old theory that at least existed on, in the eastern half of the state, that every dog gets one free bite? Well, this court has long since uh, decried that that's not the standard in Maryland. There is no one bite rule in Maryland. and. It's the showing of aggressiveness or the propensity to do something or any viciousness which is enough to put somebody on notice. You don't have to have the showing. It just doesn't have to be a bite. Correct. I will reiterate there is no direct evidence in Shields v. Wagman that the landlord ever saw the vicious or aggressive behavior this court found liability or the opportunity for a jury to make the decision. Um, Matthews had judicial notice, basically, that other courts around the country had found that pit bulls uh, were, were an aggressive or, or were a, the specific word is, well recognized that it's a dangerous breed. And when, when Judge Eldridge in footnote four cites the, I count, 14 jurisdictions that had uh, breed-specific legislation that was upheld as, as constitutional, the basis for that was that there was enough evidence that each of those courts found that the inherent viciousness of pit bulls um, was, was there such that the legislature was entitled to criminalize the behavior if you, you owned it. Are there any attempts in Maryland to legislate in this area one way or the other? Yes, Since Prince George's Maryland, County has banned pit bulls. I'm talking about state of Maryland. No, sir, I'm not aware. It's a hot political potato and nobody wants to take it. They won't even take it up in Baltimore City even when people are mauled and killed and children are killed. Um, Judge Green, you asked a question. Your brother, your brother would have called that a hot dog issue. Well, I take particular offense. Dominic Selesky almost died. But for the speedy action of citizens who grabbed his leg while his femoral artery was bleeding out and held it, and the 22-minute ride from his house to Johns Hopkins, he'd be dead today. But for four hours of surgery that saved his life. It's not funny what happened to this child. It's not funny any time a pit bull grabs a hold and doesn't let go because they don't let go. The dogsbite.org amicus wanted to show this court, in their words, that human beings are being mauled and killed every day. When I was writing my brief to this court several months ago, a case came down, and, and I get, it comes off Google to me, a Missouri woman who was pregnant with the second or third child of the couple was mauled by their pit bull. That pit bull had never shown any evidence of anything. It was kept in the house. It killed her. It killed the fetus. And the man who lost his wife and unborn child Child, loved his dog so much that he buried the three of them together. That's how macabre it gets in this country when it comes to pit bulls, advocates, and love. The ASPCA's position is that there should be no breed-specific legislation. 
Well, sorry, but many states around the country and, and, and jurisdictions find that it's necessary to protect the public safety. I'm not advocating breed-specific legislation because that's not the purpose of this court. But this court has the ability to say when landlords have some information and, and the, 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 the nexus that Judge Meredith tied together in his opinion was that we proved enough to get to a jury. Judge Green, you asked a question that I hadn't answered. Uh, you asked it uh, during, during the appellant's uh, statements. The answer to the question, if the injury arose from the leased premises, there should be liability. Now, there, uh, How far does that extend? Well, yeah. that's, for, that's for this court to establish, but I think it's a reasonable standard. What's re what is reasonably foreseeable? Is it based on control, the landlord having control? Well, the, the control issue is whether or not you can hold the landlord owed a duty. And the control issue in this case was she didn't need to relet in the second lease with one or two pit bulls. That was the control which this court found in Shields was far enough to get to the next issue. So the, uh, it's not a control issue, but how far? That, that's an interesting would question. Be, would it be a child's, if the dog escaped and there was a child's park a quarter mile away, would it extend that far? I will say that this court cited approvingly to the Cronin case out of the New York, uh, a New York app case. In Cronin, uh, and both Shields and Matthew cite uh, uh, to Cronin, Cronin held that a dog attack uh, at a neighbor's backyard off the lease premises gets to a jury. And this court, it, it, didn't, it wasn't talking about that in the context, but other jurisdictions are going that way, too. It's a moving target, Judge. The dog doesn't just stay still. It, it, it can go places. And if the harm is, is ambulatory, it can get places. Yes, the standard should be, if it's reasonably foreseeable, and we're talking about East Towson here, where there was uh, many houses around, many children. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, when it comes to a road. It would always be reasonably foreseeable if it was a pit bull. I didn't say that, Judge. I would say harm from a dog escaping, but we know that pit bulls are in inherently dangerous. They have viciousness that's been judicially recognized. It would be perfectly reasonable for this court to, as uh, to assert uh, not a per se negligence rule, but a rebuttable presumption when it came to pit bulls. That would not be an unreasonable evidentiary standard, a rebuttable presumption. Certainly not, because... The, How much of your case is dependent upon the pit bull breed? In this instance, none. Okay. I mean... It uh, sounded like it. Well, it's because premises liability in Maryland can be so difficult for a plaintiff to get to a jury. And Shields and, and, and Matthews in 1998 apparently moved the jurisprudence, but uh, landlords didn't take notice. Landlords didn't take notice when Judge Eldridge wrote that paragraph that he wrote about one of the purposes sometimes in, in, in writing a decision is so you put people on notice so they change their behavior. Well, pit bulls do bite. They do bite deeply. They, they, they kill people every day and year. And yet, here we are talking about this child, and I have to listen to seven puns about dogs and dogs biting and everything else. It's not a laughing matter. If, if your position, I, I thought you just responded that your position about the rebuttal presumption didn't rely on pit bulls being inherently vicious. I don't need it that. What you have is the fact you had two pit bulls in a pen and somebody saw them and a couple of neighbors heard them dark, barking. The Matthews court said the, 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 the viciousness of this breed is well known in 1998. Under the general rule, Judge, Ask you the question in case you had misspoke. No, but under the general rule that everyone in our in our society is uh, is taken to be knowledgeable about what the legislature writes and what, what appellate courts write, landlords should have known that, that Matthew said what it said, even though it was a four to three decision. The viciousness of this breed is well known. So, thank, thank you, you Your Honor, for your mm -hmm. thank you. Number sixty-eight. 